Our Father and our God, we declare that this is the day that you have made. And we purpose to rejoice and be glad in it. We only permit those things that will cause us joy to happen to us today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we gather at your feet, Lord Jesus, we pray that the spirit of grace, the blessed teacher, will gather with us and will teach us and will expound scriptures, give us clarity, give us understanding, give us the ability and the will to live out what we are learning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, spirit of grace, for those that are here, those that are coming, those that were here and left, Father, if it be your will, bring them back because we're having such fun. We we'll give you thanks and we we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You're welcome to Bible study this morning. Uh, like we always say, we are, I believe, Bible Fellowship and we're in Houston, Texas. We love the Lord unreservedly and unashamedly. We study scriptures line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse, from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 21 22. Because we believe no one buys a book and jumps about the, the chapters, the paragraphs, or the sentences in the book. You will never understand the book nor the mind of the author, which is why we do what we do. And we thank God his grace has been more than sufficient for us. We are in the Old Testament, of course, and we're in the book of Ezekiel. And like I said yesterday, hopefully we'll finish it by the end of this month. Uh, and uh, the other uh, books... Uh, very, very short. I think Daniel is the only other long one, really, uh, in, in the rest of the Old Testament that we have to study. I cannot wait to get into the New Testament for us to begin to see the New Testament realities of who we are, the authority that we have, and the power that's available to us. Glory to God. So without further ado, let's jump into Ezekiel chapter 22. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now, thou son of man, will thou judge? Will thou judge the bloody city? Yea, thou shalt show her all her abominations. Then say thou, thus saith the Lord God, the city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. Thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed and hast defiled thyself in thine idols, hast defined thyself, defiled thyself in thine idols which thou hast made. And thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and have come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. Those that be near, and those that be far from thee, shall mock thee, which art infamous and much vexed. Behold, the princes of Israel, every one were in thee to their power to shed blood. In thee have they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised my holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. In thee are men that carry tills to shed blood. And in thee they eat upon the mountains. In the midst of thee they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one had committed abomination with his neighbor's wife, and another had lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law, and another in thee had humbled his sister, his father's daughter. In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion, and hast forgotten me saith the Lord God. Behold, therefore, I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made, and at thy blood which thou which hath been in the midst of thee. Can thine heart endure, or can, thy, can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen, and disperse thee in the countries, and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. And thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. 
they are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore, I will gather you in the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her, princes, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have dubbed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Glory to God. <clears throat> uh, as a quick recap, you recall that Ezekiel, like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel, all of these guys prophesied pre uh, the captivity to Babylon, during the captivity in Babylon, and after they were restored. Uh, Ezekiel, slightly different from the other prophets because God dealt with him um, uh, visually. A lot of his prophecies, God had him act out. Uh, we read a, a few chapters ago that for 360 days or something like that, God had him lie on one side and then lie on another side and then lie on another side. So he, he had spoken and spoken and spoken and sent prophets after prophets after prophets and they were not listening. So God said, all right, Let's play some video if you don't want to listen to audio. And God had Jeremy, uh, Ezekiel act out a lot of the things that he planned to do. And that's how God is with us even today. God will send people. God will draw. God will appeal. God will, will orchestrate uh, situations and circumstances. You pick up a book. You keep seeing the same thing repeated you pick up a book it's talking about blue you walk into a room you see blue you're riding the bus you hear blue god keeps orchestrating situations to get your attention and for you and i in the uh, new testament thank god for the dispensation of grace and i'm going to do a slight detour uh maybe on thursday let me teach on dispensations so that you understand the different dispensations uh, someone remind me on Wednesday night, please, Jewel, so that I can prepare to teach on dispensations. You need to understand why God does what he does at a given time with people. We are under the dispensation of grace. And so sometimes it would appear that we get away with a lot of stuff. But God will not be mocked. He's still as holy as he was when he dealt with his people back in the day. The reason why you see him meeting out almost instant, and we can't even say instant because he warns for years, all right? The reason why we see him meet out justice uh, in the Old Testament is because they were not under grace. They were under the law. And so you and I who are under the grace should, should walk with our heads held high. We should walk with the, with the knowledge that we have the ability to live above sin. We can't. 
All right. There are things we will inadvertently do. I admit because we're in the flesh. Some of us is anger. Some of us is impatience. Some of us is still using unwholesome words. There are things we will still do as long as we're in this world and we're grappling with the, with the nonsense that surrounded us. That's why God said consistently in, this, in the New Testament, come out from amongst them and be ye separate. Because it's easy to, to, to be corrupted. The Bible says bad company, evil company corrupts good manners. And the example I like to give, which is really graphic, if I'm standing on a ledge, I'm standing on a table, and you're standing on the ground, which is easier for me to pull you up onto the ledge or the table or for you to pull me down? Which one is easier? Of course, it's easier for you to pull me down than it is for me to pull you up. That's why you don't want to hang out with unbelievers. Come to Psalms 1 real quick. Psalms 1. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I'm not going to go into all of that psalm. I wish I had the time to. But look at the progression. First of all, the Bible says he walks with them. He's comfortable with them. He goes where they go. He goes to the club. When you go to the club, what are you going to see? You're going to see stuff that's going to pull your heart away from God. Period. I don't go to the club, not because I don't have the liberty to go to the club. The Holy Ghost cannot stop me from going to a club if I want to. But I choose not to go to a club because of the things I will see and hear. They will corrupt my heart. It's not because I'm not with it and I don't know how to dance or whatever. No, I don't want to see those things because I have to protect my eye gate, my ear gate. Don't walk with the ungodly. All right? Don't walk in their counsel. Don't listen to their advice. I don't care how good it sounds. Ultimately, the end of it will not benefit you. The Bible says they walk with the ungodly and they become comfortable to the place where they now stand. You know, I can walk you, with you some distance and then I turn off and I go my way. But then they go from just walking casually with the unbeliever, they stand with the unbeliever. They now begin to hold the same opinion with the unbeliever. I stand for this and they stand for that too. Regardless of whatever. Because society has said homosexuality is acceptable and they've paid. Believe me, they have paid for studies. Because people who want to drive an agenda in the political scene, they pay for studies. They pay for all kinds of things to, to bear credence to whatever it is they want to push forward. Every organ of your body has a function. No one has to tell the penis where to go. It knows where to go. All right? And I will teach these things. I don't care whose ox is gored. They begin to stand for what they stand for. They believe they were made like that. God is not a freak. Every living thing, every living thing produces after its own kind. If you cannot produce after your own kind, you are in a dead relationship. Period. Why are you coming after children born by heterosexuals? Hallelujah. All right? They don't only stand in the way of the sinners. They now seat with them. Sin is progressive. All right? I don't teach about sin all the time. Those of you who have been with me for uh, uh, two years, you know that. But the book of Ezekiel dictates that I say the things that I say. All right? So don't hang out with these people. I'm back, in, uh, I'm back in the book of Ezekiel. God said to him, he's very definite and he's very specific about dates. So we know this is not fable. This is not stories. All right. God said to him that uh, he should begin to judge. All right. 
set him to begin to judge and to begin to show the city all of her wrongdoings because God is a just God. All right? He's not just going to say to you, uh, he's not just going to punish you or, or meet out punishment without telling you what you've done. I remember when my kids were little, I had a little yellow chair that I called the thinking chair. And whenever they did anything wrong, I would say, go sit on your thinking chair and think about what you've done. And then you come back and tell me what you think we should do about it. All right. And I, I remember my son, he would come back and say, well, I, I think you should spank me. <laughs> he thinks so. <laughs> Glory to God. But God will give you ample opportunity to turn around is what I'm saying. God lists out everything that they were doing so that he can be a just God. Verse 4, you have become guilty in that you have shed blood. You have defiled yourself with idols. You have made, <clears throat> you've, you've, uh, you have caused the days to draw near and have come even unto thy years. That's what I was saying the other day when I said mercy and truth have kissed. The truth of God's judgment has come face to face with mercy. And he's saying to mercy, what else are you going to say now? I've had mercy. I've shown loving kindness and tender mercy. I have forgiven iniquities. I have been patient. And Mercy at that point in time just throws up her hands and says, hey, I don't know what else to say. If justice needs to be meted out, then it needs to be meted out. All right? <clears throat> the word therefore in scriptures, I've told you, when you see therefore, you have to go back to find what therefore is there for. God said as a result of A, B, C, and D, therefore I have made thee a reproach unto the heathen and a mocking to all the countries. And you just need to go back and read history about the Holocaust and what those people went through. When Moses was giving them the law, he told them, he said, they will take you to slave markets and no one will want to buy you. Go and look at the pictures of the Holocaust. They were, they were skin and bones. No other group of people have been so maltreated like the, 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 the Jews during the Holocaust. And I know you will tell me about slavery. And I know slavery was, is an abomination. It's something that never should have happened. But we have a few strong people who emerged out of that. And if it wasn't for the intervention of the international community, all right, only God knows what Hitler was going to do. God told them that it's as a result of, of your iniquity. All right? God said, those that are near, those that are far from you, they will mock you because you become infamous and much vexed. The princes of Israel, everyone, they were just there to shed blood. They didn't care about doing things the right way. All right? They dealt by oppression of the stranger. They vexed the fatherless and the widow. And God said to us in Isaiah 58, he said, the, the fasting, that I require of you is not just abstinent from food, is that you should you should assist these people, assist the weak, feed the hungry, go out and uh, out of your way to help someone who is in need. All right, you have despised my holy things, you have profaned my Sabbath. God commanded a day of rest. Look at what society has become. When I came to this country in 1979. We had something called Sunday blue laws in this country. There were things you couldn't buy on a Sunday. As a matter of fact, you walked into a store, parts of the store was cordoned off and you couldn't buy stuff in that section of the store. Shops were not open on Sunday. And then they relaxed the law a little and they would open it and they would, you know, barricade certain areas. You couldn't buy those things. You couldn't buy liquor on a Sunday. Little by little, they started to relax the laws. They started to relax the laws. They started to, to the extent now that we have Amazon that will even bring it to my door. God who made you, who knows your constitution and why he made you the way he made you, said you should take one day out of seven to rest. I know society has it now that Sunday or Saturday cannot be the Sabbath because they have us working. But I know that they don't make you work all seven days of the week. They may give you Tuesday and Wednesday off or give you Thursday and Friday off or however that they do it. But God requires that you rest your body one day. 
He even requests that we rest the land. And he knows the reason why. But we, I mean, I told you yesterday, COVID set a lot of things straight in my mind. I don't believe in deadlines anymore. Take your deadline away. Whatever it is I want from you that you're giving me a deadline, I can live without. I've lived without it before your deadline. And I certainly can and will continue to live without that thing. It's not that crucial. All right? So respect your body. Take care of your body. If you don't take care of your body, it's going to hinder the real you, the spirit man. All right? God said, you despise my holy things. You profane my Sabbath. Uh, there were tail carriers amongst you to shed blood. You ate upon the mountains, and that's in, in reference to all the groves and all the uh, places that they built for all the strange gods. They were, they were serving, verse 10, in thee have they discovered their father's nakedness, sons raping their fathers. Because that's what that means, to discover the nakedness of your father. It means to rape your father. Come with me to... I'm looking for the story of, uh, what's the name of this guy? Noah. Book of Genesis. The story, of, was it Lot? N Noah. No, 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 no. Noah. The story of Noah and his three sons. All right. Let me show you so that you know the lewdness of these people and the crazy stuff they were doing. Uh, Thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I didn't plan to go there, so I don't remember the reference. I know it's, uh, it's Genesis. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, boy. Small Genesis what? 9. Genesis 9. Genesis 9? Yeah. Um, verse 20, from verse 20. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Genesis 9.20, and Noah began to be a husband man. He was, he was a, a, a vine keeper and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. All right. If it was just that uh, Ham saw with his eyes his father having, uh, 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 you know, become intoxicated. If it was just that he took off his garments or or his his duvet that he covered his body with. If it was just that he physically saw him, the Bible won't say the next thing that it says. All right. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. If you're sleeping and I come into your bedroom, will you know that I've come into your bedroom? No. If you're in a drunken stupor and I come into your bedroom, will you know that I've come into your bread bedroom? Probably not. But when the Bible says he woke up and he knew what the son had done, it meant the son violated him because he saw the evidence on it on his body. All right? And, and the other two boys, of course, they, they didn't go in, uh, you know, face front. They, they put a garment on their shoulders, walked backwards, and covered their father's nakedness. And that kind of nonsense was still going on as at this time that uh, uh, Ezekiel was, was uh, a, a prophet in the land. All right? Verse 10. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. Somebody was set apart. Uh, uh, maybe for a fast or whatever God, God required for them to, to abstain or whatever. And they went and they possibly had their way with the, with the person. All right. They committed abomination with the neighbor's wife. All right. Literally defiled uh, a, a father sleeping with his son's wife. All kinds of crazy things they were doing. It was necessary that God should judge. Otherwise, he would be an unjust God. All right. So uh, uh, he goes on and on and on and on. Verse 17, all the way down. Imagine the Holocaust. All right? Because those guys, they went through hell. All right? Verse 23, God said, uh, Son of man, 24, say unto her, thou art the land that is not cleansed and rained upon in the day of indignation. All right? There's a conspiracy of our prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion. They were lying to them. They were doing all kinds of things. And so it was, it was, it, it behoved God 
to judge. But like I always say for us in the New Testament, thank God for Jesus Christ going to the cross. Thank God that you and I don't have to face the wrath of God. And he, he saved us and left us behind because it, it were better that he saved us and, you know, take us home straight. Heaven is better than whatever it is that we have here. But he left us behind because of his love for humanity so that you and I can continue to preach this gospel and continue to tell people the truth. Whether they want to hear it or not is irrelevant. We have a duty of care. Uh, in this self same Ezekiel, I, I think it's chapter 18, a few chapters uh, behind. Uh, verse 4 says, behold, Ezekiel 18, behold, all souls are mine. All souls, whether born again or not, they belong to God. And as the soul of the father, so also so the son of the son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. That's why you and I, who are the recipients of his grace and the benefits of salvation, cannot be silent. We have to tell people, walk away from sin. The Bible says the soul that sins shall die. And not only that, God says, I will require it of you that didn't tell them. Let me look for that verse. It's there somewhere. And if I cannot find it, I will look for the reference and give it to you. God says, I will inquire of your hand when you don't tell the wicked to turn away from their ways. I can't find it, but let me not waste time with that. But it's there in the scriptures. You know, I lie not. God will require it of us if we don't tell people. And there are many ways that you can correct people. I teach the way I teach because I'm talking to disciples. But if I was talking to somebody outside of people who pay the price, who want to know God, I have to give it to you straight up. But if I'm talking to someone outside, I know how I'm going to couch it so that I don't chase them away. So you get it straight from me here because you are one step above that. In fact, more than one step above that. To commit daily to come and hear the word is not an easy thing. All right? So we've got, we have a duty of care to let the world know that the way of sin is death. All right? And like I said too, uh, death is not necessarily cessation of life. You can be alive and be dead in various areas of your life. If you think of life and death as a continuum to the extent that you're ignorant over something, you're dead in that area. And until you find out the truth about that situation, you continue to operate in death. Glory to God. All right, so God says uh, the sins of the priests and the princes and the prophets and the people from verse 23 on down. And then he says in, in, in verse 30, I sought for a man. I'm looking for just one person. Ezekiel 3.18, thank you, Sumbo. I have some great scholars in this place. Ezekiel 3.18 says, yada, yada, da. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his sins, but his blood will I require at thine hand. You who didn't tell them. So, but thank you. All right? So we have a duty of care to tell people. Glory to God. God says in verse 30, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge. God is looking for intercessors. God is, because listen, I've taught you this. And if you get this, you will be fine. One, you are a spirit being. You live inside a body. And the body does not have any say. All right? As a spirit being, you need a body to operate on firma terra or terra firma on this earth. Okay? If you understand that, you understand that God as a spirit has no right. Yes, almighty God has no right to operate on earth unless man allows it. It's his law. That's why he couldn't show up for the work of salvation. He had to become incarnate. 
He had to take on flesh and blood. There's only one legitimate way to come to planet Earth. It's through the birth canal of a woman. Any other way is illegal. That's the reason why we can challenge demons and tell them to go. And they must go because they know they are illegal operators and occupants in whatever they're occupying, a house, a person, a tree, whatever. And so God is looking for one person that will authorize him to come and act. This is why we pray. Prayer is not a chore. Prayer is an opportunity for me to co-govern with God. Prayer is an opportunity, opportunity for me to be able to say to God, all right, God, I need you to intervene in that matter. Because he has to have permission. That's who you are. And that's how important you are in the scheme of things. God said, I'm looking for one man who will make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land or for souls. Why? So that I will not destroy it. But I couldn't find one. Not one. This is why we pray. This is why in the place of prayer, we can change things. And we need to understand that and begin to walk in that authority. The Bible says in Psalm 82, ye are gods. And gods have the power and the ability to superimpose on the natural. Glory to God. I'm not talking about the God they talk about in New Age. So God said, because I could not find anybody, therefore, verse 31, I couldn't find anybody, therefore, I poured out my indignation upon them. I consumed them with fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads. That sentence is very important. It tells me that God is not this old ogre sitting there with a baseball bat ready to bash my head in the moment I do something wrong. It's the law of sowing and reaping. What they sowed is what they reaped. So God is not a mean God waiting to just punish you the moment you slip up. No. It is when you continue in spite of everything he does to draw you. When you continue, then your ways will attract the punishment for what you're doing. There's not one ounce of God that is mean or wicked. He's altogether lovely. But it's the things that we do, especially when we don't repent and when we don't turn away from it. God knows what we'll sin. That's why the Bible says, confess ye your sins one to another. A little caveat from Pastor Mo. There's some people that are Radio Houston. You don't want to confess to them or radio whatever city that you live in. So know that you're safe with whomever you tell your business to. It's not someone you tell at 10 o'clock and by 12 noon, all of Houston knows it. So when the Bible says confess your sins one to another, it's not saying go and blab your business, you know, all over the place. There's some people whose mouths are, are running. So God said, their own way have I recompensed upon their heads. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any practical application? Uh, Pastor Mo. Yes, sir. So um, in verse, I believe it says 28, when it talks about her prophets, um, I'm reading from the NIV version to apologize, um, but um. But um, it says whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. Um, could um, and they say that what the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. Can you expound on that a little bit more? All right. Basically, God said the the prophets and the princes were prophesying lies to the people. Um, if if you had been with us at the earlier uh, part of the New Testament, you would actually see that they were lying to the people. Uh, when Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was, was weeping profu profusely, and he, he wrote lamentations, and he was telling them, listen, the, this judgment is coming, this captivity is coming. The priests were telling the people, don't mind him, he's crazy. 
You know, they, they jailed him. They did all kinds of crazy things to him. Uh, and they were telling people, no, there's not going to be any war. No, there's not going to be. That's what God was saying here, that <clears throat> they kept lying to the people and they kept saying, thus said the Lord. Truth be told, child of God, John 8, 32, you shall know the truth. And the truth that you know, not the one Pastor Mo knows, the truth shall set you free. So if you know what the word of God has said, there is no man of God that can lie to you. If you walk with the Holy Spirit, when you hear a lie or a falsity, there will be an alarm that will go off in your spirit. It won't sit right. You will know something is funny. This is why you need to know the word for yourself. All prophecies must have three components. First Corinthians chapter 14. It must comfort, it must edify, and it must exhort. If it doesn't comfort me, it's not from God. If it doesn't edify me build, me, build me up, it's not from God. If it doesn't exhort me and challenge me and encourage me, it's not from God. The Bible is clear. So don't come and tell me, I saw you in a dream and, and you, 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 know, you were driving and you had a car crash. No, that's absolute garbage. If God shows you that, he shows it to you for a reason. Get on your face and intercede for me. Because you have the power and the authority to avert it. So we have to know the truth. And the truth we know is what sets us free. Don't take it at face value. The Bible talks about the Berean Christians. They went back to verify that what Paul was teaching was true. Because they had the book of the law. You and I have the Bible today. So if I tell you thus and such, and you don't find it in the scriptures, Chuck it. Are you clear on that? Yes. Um, actually, it was confirmation for me because this morning I was actually doing a devotional. And in that devotional, it basically was saying that you need to test the spirit by the spirit all the time so that you can know whether it's from God and whether it's from Satan, because there's a lot of people who want to say God said and want to insert that. And so um, I'm just so glad that you was able to um, to break that down for me. Tumbo, look for this scripture for me. It says the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. We have to have a close relationship with the spirit of God. More than you even want to be led by him. He wants to lead you. I mean, I'm a parent. I know how I feel about my children. You cannot touch my child. I will die. Literally. You can't touch my child while I'm standing. Now, if I feel like that about my children and I'm a biological parent, how do you think God feels about you? He wants to lead you. Well, he's not going to force himself on you. You've got to take the time to find out what he has to say about that situation. And God has a word for every last situation in your life. There is not, I mean, I was talking to my son the other day. Um, something had upset him. And he was like, you know, I, I, I'm going to show I don't do this normally, but I'm going to show this individual, you know, and, and, and I know my son, he has a very gentle heart. So I said to him, no, son, you don't, there's no need. There's absolutely no need. I, I, I knew what had happened. I knew that it was wrong. But I said, don't do it. And he said, no, man, I, I, you know, I've taken so much. I, I have to show this individual. And I said, no, I have a scripture that I can give to you that tells you no. He said, what's the scripture? So I told him. And he said, ah, all right, mom. <laughs> and he let it go. I, even I, when I was telling him, no, don't do that. I was, I was advising based on just wisdom from an elder. But as I talked to him, that scripture popped into my heart. And I said to him, I, I have a scripture to tell you that what I'm telling you is, is the right thing to do. Because he said, no, he had said no to me. When I said, no, don't go that route. He said, no, I need to show this person because I've been, I've been tolerant, I've been patient. I need to put a stop to it. And I said, no, I have a scripture. He said, what's the scripture? I gave him the scripture and he said, all right, I give up. You need to know the word because that's what's going to guide you. 
when you're faced with, is it God? Is it not God? There will be a word that will jump out at you. All right. Chapter 23. Pastor Mo, sorry. My favorite thing about, you know, like the false prophets and like having to know the best illustration. Remember Ahab and what's his name? Josephat. Mm -hmm. I think First Kings 22, where it was like all the prophets, the 400 and there were like 400 prophets that were prophesying and saying, go down. And Joseph, but he knew because he knew God and he was working with God. He was like, is there no real prophet amongst this no. place? Okay. And that's, that's the reason. just really, really funny. But that's like, for me, my classic example where it's like, in the world we say, majority carries the vote. Mm -mm. No. That is one of the biggest lies of the enemy. Majority doesn't call, just because everybody is preaching about a particular thing doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. True. That's true. And in actual fact, majority is you and God. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's you and God, not the number of people out there saying this is it or that's how it is. Mm -mm. What mm -hmm. does God have to say about it? He has mm -hmm. the final. Mm -hmm. Chapter 23. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There where their breast pressed, and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them were Ahola the elder, and Aholiba her sister. And they were mine, and they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names Samaria. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem is Aholiba. And Ahola played the harlot when she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue, Captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses, which were uh, thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols she defiled herself. Neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt, for in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breasts of her virginity and poured their whoredom upon her. Wherefore, I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the, of the Assyrians upon whom she doted. These discovered her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and slew her with the sword. And she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. And when her sister Aholiba saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms more than her sister in her whoredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way, and that she increased her whoredoms. For when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads all of them princes to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea and the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them unto Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love and they defiled her with their whoredom and she was polluted with them and her mind was alienated from them. So she discovered her whoredoms, she discovered her nakedness, then my mind was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her daughter, from her sister. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. For she doted upon their paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Thus thou callest them remembrance, calls to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth, in bruising thy teeth by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth. Therefore, O Aholiba, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Picod and Shoah, and Koah and all the Assyrians, with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. 
And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons, and wheels, and with an assembly of people which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgment. And I will set my je jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose and thine ears, and thy remnant shall they fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be, shall be devoured by the fire. They shall also strip thee out of thy, of thy clothes and take away thy fair jewels. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee, and thy whoredoms brought from the land of Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver thee unto the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them from whom thy mind is alienated. And they shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away all thy labor, and shall leave thee naked and bare. And the nakedness of thy whoredoms shall be discovered, both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. I will do these things unto thee, because thou hast gone a-whoring after the heathen, and because thou art polluted with their idols. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn, and, hath, and had in derision, it containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with a cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister, Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it, and suck it out, and thou shalt break the shirts thereof, and pluck off thine own breast. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, thou hast forgotten me, and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. The Lord said moreover unto me, son of man, will thou judge Ahola and Aholibah? Yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands. And with their idols have they committed adultery, and have also caused their sons, whom they bear unto me, to pass for them through the fire, to devour them. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent for men to come from far, unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came, for whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thine eyes, and deckest thyself with ornament, and satest upon a stately bed, and a table prepared before it, whereupon thou hast set mine in incense and mine oil. And a voice of a multitude being at ease what was with her, and with the men of the common sort were brought Sabians from the wilderness, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. Then said I unto her that was old in adulteries, Will they now commit whoredoms with her and she with them? Yet they went in unto her as they go in unto a woman that playeth the harlot. So went they in unto Ahola and, on, and unto Aholiba, the lewd women. And the righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women that shed blood, because they are adulteresses and blood is in their hands. For thus saith the Lord God, I will bring up a company upon them and will give them to be removed and spoiled. And the company shall stone them with stones and dispatch them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn up their houses with fire. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. And they shall recompense your lewdness upon you and ye shall bear the sins of your idols and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Same story basically, but this time specific to Samaria and Jerusalem. Uh, for those of you who have recently joined us, uh, we studied earlier on, Israel was one nation uh, under uh, 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 David and Solomon, but Solomon sinned against God and God said to him, because of the covenant that I have with your father David, I'm not going to split the kingdom while you are king. So after Solomon died, 
God split the kingdom into two because uh, Rehoboam, who was Solomon's uh, biological son, and Jeroboam, who was his servant, now became the kings in the two uh, kingdoms. Jeroboam ruled over the 10 northern tribes, and they are, they are commonly referred to as Samaria, the 10 northern tribes. That was Samaria. And then uh, Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, ruled over the two southern kingdoms, uh, commonly referred to as Jerusalem. That was Judah and Benjamin. All right. So um, same situation. God had uh, Ezekiel prophesy uh, to Samaria and to Jerusalem, but he called them Ahola and Aholiba. And basically they did the same thing. First, it was Samaria that went into apostasy and all of the kings that reigned in, su in succession, it was like they were striving to outdo each other. Uh, to a large extent, Judah, which is the Southern kingdom uh, that had Jerusalem as, as its capital, to a large extent, they, they tried to remain faithful to God, but eventually, they, they also went into apostasy. And from what we see here of Ezekiel's account, uh, Judah even did worse than Samaria. Uh, today, Samaria is no more. The 10 Northern tribes are, are lost. They've either been subsumed by other civilizations or they are totally extinct. We don't know, but we do know that those 10 tribes no longer exist. So the present day Israel is the Southern kingdom. Um, Again, he listed all of the stuff that they were doing. I don't need to go into it. Uh, but I do want to mention, uh, because I see a parallel, that the people that Aholiba and uh, Ahola were committing uh, uh, whoredoms with, that they were sinning with, the Bible describes them as, as very good looking. Verse 7 says, they were chosen men of Assyria. Uh, Bible says they were they were good to look at. They were strong men. They were they were dressed in 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 fine raiment. They were captains and rulers. Verse twelve says they were most gorgeously dressed. They were horsemen riding upon horses. All of them desirable young men, and that's the character of sin. Sin is pleasurable. The Bible says so. Come to Hebrews twelve or Hebrews eleven. Hebrews eleven. The Bible says sin is pleasurable. And I'm going to close with this, uh, with this thought for you to understand sin. First of all, there's no good thing in the flesh. Somebody please look for that scripture and put it up for me. There is no good thing in the flesh. Uh, Hebrews 11. I'm going to read from verse 23 to verse da, 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 29, and I'll break it down right quick. When we study the book, we'll go through it again. But for you to know, talking about Moses, uh, the Bible says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hit three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child, a goodly child. All right. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. The king had commanded that all uh, male children be killed because the, the, the children of Israel were multiplying in numbers. And he was afraid that they would uh, outnumber them uh, disadvantageously. So he commanded that all of them be killed. Every male child two years and under. Herod repeated the same thing when Jesus was born. Thank you, Sumbo. What does Romans 7, 18, 20 say? Do you have it to read? Yes. So now it is no longer um, I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Super. That's the one I was looking for. So they hit the boy. Verse 24, Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, and I'm reading King James. All right. So if you have King James, I need you to circle these words. I don't know how it's put in other translations. I use the King James because it's the closest in translation to the original Greek language uh, in the which the Bible was written. Old Testament was written in Aramaic or the Hebrew language. New Testament was written in Greek and it's the closest in translation to it. I don't, I don't have anything against translations. Um, if it helps you to understand better, great. 
but I read the King James. And if you have King James, I want you to circle these words because it will help you. Verse 23 says, by faith, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused. And he just circled the word refused. The Bible says when he was come to years, when he came to maturity, when he could think by himself, when he could reason by himself, when he could judge by himself, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Child of God, if you're going to walk in holiness and integrity before God, there are certain things you must refuse. You have to. There is no circling around it. There's no going down under it. There's No, you just must refuse. All right? Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Circle the word choose. You must choose. When you refuse, you choose. If you refuse and you don't choose, you'll eventually go back to what you're familiar with. You must refuse and then you must choose. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. I told you the Bible says sin is pleasurable. It is. That's why the flesh wants it. Galatians 5, go and read it, verse 20, verse, I think 17 all the way down to 22. What your body wants to do, your spirit doesn't want to do. And what your spirit wants to do, your body doesn't want to do. And so there's this constant battle between the spirit and the body. And the battleground is your mind, your soul. That's why you've got to be able to control your thinking. You have to control your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, and your imagination. You must control those five senses of the soul. Otherwise, you will not be able to live a victorious Christian life. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, which is usually for a season. Sin is pleasurable just for a while. Because when the consequences come, it's not funny. All right? Next thing he did, verse 26, he esteemed. That is to say, he weighed the pros and the cons. He judged. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the riches and the treasures of Egypt. So he sat down and he analyzed the situation. Do I want to remain in Egypt because I'm a prince? Or I want to identify with who I truly am, even though I will become a slave. And he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the riches and the treasures that Egypt had to offer. Why? Because he respected the recompense of the reward. Circle the word respect. He judged what he would benefit to walk as a child of God. He judged it better than what he would benefit if he remained a prince in Egypt. This is how you walk uprightly before God. It is possible, child of God. All right? When he refused, he chose. And then he judged. He weighed the pros and the cons, and he had respect. He judged that this option is better for me. Okay? Next in verse 27, he then forsook. He walked away from that situation that always puts him in trouble. There's some friends you don't want to hang out with anymore. There's some places you don't want to go to anymore. There's some things you don't want to set before your eyes anymore. If you're going to walk with God. All right? The Bible says he forsook Egypt. He walked away from it. He made a decision and he walked away from it. He wasn't afraid of the wrath of the king. And then he endured. Christianity is not for yo-yo Christians up to day down tomorrow. Christianity is for people with character, with integrity. It's for people who are a people of purpose. It's for people who know where they're going, who have believed God. Guys, it's God, 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 or God. And if I had to choose again, it would be God or God. 
and it takes strength of character to swim upstream. Every idiot can coast downstream. You don't have to do nothing. The water will carry you. Okay? The Bible says he forsook and he endured. Because when you, when you decide that you're going to walk with God, challenges will come. Make no mistakes about it. The devil doesn't like to lose a battle. Truth be told, he has brain damage because the Bible says Jesus bruised his head. That's why he can't get it through his head that he has lost some of us and he needs to back off. Okay? The Bible says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Then the next thing he did, he kept the faith. Verse 28. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he should be destroyed, uh, uh, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So, he refused, he chose, he judged, he esteemed the reproach. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Then he forsook his old ways and he endured the challenges that came from the decision to forsake his old ways. And then he kept the faith. He kept doing the right thing. He kept praying. He kept fasting. He kept coming to fellowship. He kept speaking the word. He kept believing God. He did the right thing. And by so doing, verse 29, he passed. He passed through. He walked uprightly. He succeeded. All right? These are the things you need to do in the New Testament. If you're going to walk right with God. Glory to God. Questions or answers or, or, or thoughts or comments? I have one, Pastor Mel. Sorry, I didn't want to say it right away. My seatbelt's not on. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my question, <laughs> thank you, God. Um, so my question is, um, it's actually, so on the topic of, you know, talking about sin and talking about things we should not do and worldly things, I have a question um, as far as when it comes to uh, marijuana. What does, um, you know, because I know we talked about, um, and, you know, from what I've perceived from when it comes to, you know, marijuana or alcohol, things of that nature, comes down to uh, like hallucinations, slurring of words, things in that nature. Um, what if, what if, you know, cause I, me personally, I've never done it, but our friends do, we have this conversation. Sorry, I got right. cut out there. But we have these conversations, just wondering um, what, what, um, you know, what happened or it, like, is it bad? Is it, you know? You remember too, uh, I yeah. guess when a few days ago, I told you I used to smoke. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't see anything in the Bible that said thou shalt not smoke. And even though I was born again, I was a Christian, I was smoking. And people mm -hmm. would tell me, you know, you really shouldn't that so on and so forth. I didn't pay any mind until I mm -hmm. had an encounter with God. And that's what mm -hmm. helped me away from smoking. Now, mm -hmm. my question is this. I've never smoked weed before, so I don't know. My yeah, question that's what I was going to say. <laughs> does, it, does it alter my mind? That's the thing. I personally don't know. Um, I, I've never smoked weed before, so it I don't. Alters, if it alters my mind, if it alters my ability to judge, I will okay. not touch it. Okay. So, Any... whereas the Bible doesn't say that shall not smoke weed. And okay. people are talking about CBD and the benefits of cannabis and all of this and the other. Mm -hmm. Me, personally, mm -hmm. this is the truth. I don't take medication. And I'm not saying run out there and stop taking medication. Hear me and hear me good. Good. I have exercised my faith to the point where I don't need medication. When I have a headache, I lay my hands on myself. I command the headache to go. It goes. It has taken years. I've been walking with the Lord in excess of 40 years. So I'm not saying medication is bad. All I'm saying to you is if it alters my mind or my ability to judge or assess, I'm not going to touch it. At the end of the day, the Bible says you cannot judge another man's servant. To his master, he stands or he falls. Someone please look for that scripture for me. 
You cannot judge another man's servant. If you are in doubt and you're a child of God, go and ask him and see what he says to you. If it alters my mind, alters my ability to judge, because I've seen people who smoke weed. I've seen the effects on them. I wouldn't want to be in that situation. I mean, people say uh, it heightens creativity. It does this, it does that. Uh, CBD does it. I don't need it. I got the word. And the word works. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. Any form of sickness is an oppression of the devil. Bottom line. Yeah, in the natural, we may be able to diagnose it and doctors will say this is what is wrong and this is the medication for it, etc., etc. But bottom line is an oppression of the devil. So hear me again and hear me good. I do not have any problems with medication. I do not have any problems with hospitals. I do not have any problems with doctors and nurses. They are doing an awesome job. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, the two most honorable professions out there is folks in the medical industry and folks in the teaching, uh, in education, who teach. They are the most underpaid individuals on the face of this earth. They should be earning more than they earn. That's my personal opinion. So whereas I cannot say to you, thou shalt not smoke hemp, I would not touch it because I need to keep my body pure and I need to keep my body holy. That's where I'm coming from. Are you there, Jaleel? Yes, ma'am. My bad. I was carrying something. Yeah. Thank you for that. So any other questions? I got a question. So earlier, uh, you spoke about, you know, how you talk to us is not the same as how you talk to other people who are not necessarily, you know, seeking God. Um, what, what's your thought process or how, how do you handle people who aren't like on the right path with and you want to like introduce them, but you don't want to offend them, but you do want to let them know like what they're doing is wrong. See, the, the power is in the word of God. So what you want to give to the person, even though you see all of the stuff that they're doing, is give the word. Give the word. Show them love. All right? When they come, they will receive milk. You know, it's, it's like, it's like uh, come, Jesus is sweet. Here's a candy. They'll come because of the candy. But when they come, they then begin to see that, oh, there's vegetables. It's not all candy. That's how it works. When I'm teaching disciples, it's different. When I'm, when I'm just talking generally, it's different. I would hope that my conduct and the way that I uh, carry myself and I walk with the Lord will be a witness to them. For them to know that, oh, someone who walks with the Lord can actually be this way because that's what happened to me. The lady who led me to the Lord did not say one word to me. I went to her and said, why are you like this? I've never seen her upset or angry. I, I took a car uh, I, with permission to use to go on a trip. I didn't check the oil and whatnot. You know, I didn't know nothing about it. I just knew to drive a car and the engine uh, packed up. I had to tow it back to the city that she lived in. And as, as the tow truck came in, <laughs> she was standing on her porch and she saw me and she started to laugh. And, you know, I was, I was scared because, I mean, this is her car. But she was laughing. And I said, why are you laughing? She said, I knew when you were leaving. I said, you knew when I was leaving? She said, yes. She said, if I, if I would have said to you, you can't use my car, you wouldn't understand. You know? So many things like that. And then finally I said to her, listen, why, why are you the way you are? Why don't you ever get upset over nothing? And she proceeded to tell me about the Lord and that her peace is found in God and nothing phases her. 
And I said to her, I said, you mean if I, if I give my heart to the Lord, I'm going to be like you? She said, more importantly, you're going to be like him. So that's how I, 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 I treat people that I, I don't know and I'm not close to. You know, um, it's like a parent. I can spank my own child, but I can't spank your child. So if I'm talking to someone who does not know me or who does not know uh, that I don't have a relationship with and I want to draw them to Christ, I present the sweet gospel. When they come and they taste and they see that the Lord is good and they want to become a disciple, then you begin to train them as disciples. And some will stay, some will go. Same thing happened to Jesus. And Jesus turned to the 12. He said, are you guys going to leave too? And said, well, where are we going to go? You have the word of life. So live the life. It will testify. Your life will be a testimony. And then just show them the love of Christ. Because people are drawn by love. Thank you. You're welcome. We're good? I got a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, Sorry, Elvin. I'll, go, I'll, ahead. go ahead. I'll sure? wait. Yeah, okay. I'll wait. Okay. Um, Pastor Mo, I wanted to ask about um, judging or judgment when, you know, some Christians, you know, by the people that they're around, they'll be told. You're muted. I've lost you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about when Christians are told that they are being judgy or they're passing judgment on others. When you were talking about protecting your space, your eye gate, your ear gate, and how Jesus, you know, when he did go into the club, um, you know, he wasn't bothered by the people, you know, there. And, you know, even in our family, you know, we have some people that are probably not, you know, not believers um, or not on the same path that we are as Christians, our Christian walk. And um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on, you know, those people that say, you know, because you're not around a certain person or in a certain place, you are supposed to be a Christian and you're not supposed to be, you know, pass judgment on others. But then I came across Second Timothy um, and I, I just, it's crazy because I just turned to it and I was just, you know, getting ready to close my Bible and it says, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke and encourage your people with good teaching. And um, I guess that pretty much answered it, but I just wanted to know your thoughts on when people pass judgment, Christians. There's a difference between judging and being judgmental. Okay. What you ought not to do as a child of God is to be judgmental. And people will quote, I think it's Matthew 7 that says, judge not that thou mayest not be judged. But they're, they're quoting that scripture out of context. The spiritual man judgeth all things. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right. Um, uh, let, let me read from verse 10. Although it starts with the word but, but tells you that, it, you know, it's a conjunction. He was talking about some other things before getting to verse 10. But so that it will make sense, I'll read from verse 10. But God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. And that's capital S, the Holy Spirit. Yea, the deep things of God. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know all things that are freely given to us of God. All right? Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14 is where I'm going. But the natural man 
does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually dis discerned. But he that is spiritual, you the child of God, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. We are allowed to judge. Okay? Okay. So the spiritual man judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So I can judge sin based on the word of God. All right? If someone steals, I will call it what it is. You stole. That's not being judgmental. That's judging what he did based on scriptures. Do you see the difference? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the spiritual man judges all things, but we're not judgmental. We're not condemning. We can't condemn. I, yes. If I'm not able to judge it as sin, how can I correct it? You can't. So I'm not running around you know, this holier than thou and, and being all spiritual and whatnot. But if someone does something wrong, I can judge it based on scriptures and then I can think of a way to help them overcome whatever it is that I have judged based on scriptures to be sin. So someone is a habitual liar. I would judge it as sin because lying is sin. Then I begin to look for a way to help them to stop lying. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but Pastor Mo, sorry, a little bit of clarity, please. So when you're being judgmental, you're being condemning, saying um, yeah, you're going to hell and this thing, whatever, like putting yourself in the place of God. But when you're judging sin is when this thing that you're doing is wrong. Yeah. But so no, um, this thing you're doing is wrong, but you're not pronouncing a sentence on the person. Yes, but okay. sometimes, sometimes you don't even have to even say it to the person. See, if I judge sin in someone's life, I don't necessarily have to say, Go. But, and I, you are doing this. I don't know. If I judge it based on scriptures that this person habitually lies, I begin to pray for them. And then I begin to look for ways to correct them. If it's a child, for instance, I will preface what I want to say by saying, don't lie to me. I'm not mad at you, but I need to know so I can help you. That child will not lie. So you won't be coming across judgment, judgy, uh, judgy if you say to a person, oh, you know, you curse a lot or, oh, you act ratchet, so I'm not going to be around you or I can't hang around you. That's coming across as judgmental. Because that, that, that to be perceived by the person as judgmental. You may not necessarily be, ju be judging them. You understand? But if they perceive you as being judgmental, then they'll resist you and you will not be able to bring the love of Christ to them. That's right. why I say you have to have the wisdom of God. You're right. So You're right. I judge the situation. I know it is sin because I know what the word of God says. I don't necessarily have to tell them. I just proceed to look for ways to help them become a better person in that area. Pastor, oh, sorry, is that where Matthew 7 comes in, you know, says, um, do not judge um, for you will be judged for the same measure you used to judge will be used against you that how can you say to your brother, um, you have a speck in your eye when you, you have a plank? Is that well, the same that, thing? That situation is clear. You, you have issues in your own life and then you have the nerve to be saying something about what's in another person's life, that one is clear. But if I'm living the best that I can, right, based on scriptures, and I'm following hard after God, and I see something in someone, I can judge it based on scriptures. And then I, I pray for the person and I ask God to use me to help that person so that with God's wisdom, I can help them to see the error of what they are doing. I don't have to pronounce it. I don't have to say 
them. They don't need to know what I think or what I feel. But then I begin to work with them to help them see that, listen, you can do better. People still cuss around me. People still cuss around me and I just look at them and immediately they know. And they try not to cuss anymore. So being judgmental is condemning. And it will drive the person away from you. You will not be able to give them the love of God. And you will not have the opportunity perhaps to lead them to the Lord. But if I judge it and I see that, okay, it's wrong based on scriptures, I begin to work with the person to help them get over whatever it is that they're doing. Is that clear? Uh, yes. All right. Father, we thank you. The entrance of your word brings light. It brings understanding. It brings illumination. And thank you for being taught today from your word. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for the things that you're doing in our lives. We pray that you continue to live through us and have men see that we are yours and it is possible to walk with you even in this dying world. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for staying uh, a little longer. Have a blessed day, everyone. God bless you as well. Thank you all.